In this video, we're going to look at how to calculate a cardiac output and the different kinds of factors that affect it. So in the last video, we talked about stroke volume. When we fill the ventricles with blood, that is the end diastolic volume, right? So at the end of diastole, at the end of relaxation, the ventricle is as full as possible. And then when the ventricle contracts, it is going to eject a certain volume of blood. That is the stroke volume. When we look at cardiac output, we are looking at the amount of that volume of blood ejected from the ventricle every minute. So we calculate that volume by multiplying the stroke volume by the heart rate. And if we have an average of five liters of total blood volume, and if we have an average heart rate of about 70 beats per minute, and we have an average stroke volume of about 70 milliliters per ventricular contraction, then a typical resting cardiac output is about 4.9 or 5 liters per minute. So the whole blood volume is basically circulating through the blood every single minute. So what is going to increase that? Our cardiac output is regulated for the amount of oxygen that our cells need. So when our cells require more oxygen to make more ATP or energy, then our cardiac output has to increase. So what are the factors that affect cardiac output? Anything that affects the heart rate or the stroke volume is going to affect the cardiac output. So if we look at factors that affect the heart rate first, the primary thing that is going to increase or decrease the heart rate is the autonomic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system is our fight or flight response, which we will activate during exercise or stress. And parasympathetic is our rest and digest system. So if we are exercising or we have a stress response, our cells need more oxygen, more nutrients. We have to get rid of waste. We'll be producing lactic acid, right? So we need to increase the cardiac output when we have a sympathetic response. And when we have a parasympathetic response, our overall cardiac output is going to decrease. There are two other factors though that have an effect on our heart rate and one of those is our body temperature. So if we are hot, say you're sitting in a sauna and your body temperature goes up, your heart rate will also increase even though you're not exercising and you're not stressed. So temperature has an impact. And then the other major factor that affects our heart rate is our thyroid hormones. So if you have an increase in thyroid hormone production, you will have an increase in heart rate. Thyroid hormones are all about metabolism, so that's logical. Someone that had hyperthyroidism, for example, would have a high heart rate. We have a maximum heart rate, which is the highest number of times the heart can beat in a minute. We can estimate that by doing 220 minus our age. There are a few different factors that affect our maximal heart rate, but age has the most impact. So 220 minus your age is a good rough approximate. So different people might have slightly higher or slightly lower maximal heart rates. Once you reach your maximal heart rate, your heart will begin to be inefficient it will be beating too quickly to be able to pump out enough blood for each stroke volume. So what happens when you reach your maximal heart rate? Does your heart explode <laughs> or stop? <laughs> no, it just becomes so inefficient that you actually can't keep exercising at that intensity level. So then you're not gonna get enough oxygen to your cells, you won't be able to make enough energy and you will be so out of breath because your cells need oxygen that you just simply won't be able to work any harder than that point. So your maximal heart rate is the hardest that your heart can work while still being efficient. And one other thing that I wanna point out is if your maximal heart rate is, let's suppose you're 20 years old and your approximate estimated maximal heart rate is 200 beats per minute, and you and your friend same age go for a jog, and one of you can actually, you're using your Fitbit or some kind of heart monitor, and one of you can get your heart rate to 205, and one of you can only get your heart rate to 195. That does not mean that either one of you is more or less fit. Okay, a better indication of how fit you are is how long you can keep your heart rate elevated and how quickly you recover, how quickly your heart rate can go back down to normal after high intensity exercise. 
let's go back to our stroke volume. Okay, so heart rate and stroke volume, anything that affects those is going to affect your cardiac output. Stroke volume is all about your end diastolic volume and your end systolic volume. How much blood can get into the ventricle and then how much blood can you eject from the ventricle? Okay, so first let's talk about how much your ventricles can stretch or fill. If you can increase your end diastolic volume, what do you think is going to happen to your stroke volume? Do you think it will have an impact? Okay, let's look at a ventricle. Okay, here we have a ventricle that is full of blood volume. So this is the end diastolic volume. It's the amount of fluid that is in the heart after it's been relaxing. And my fingers are the aortic semilunar valve. So if the heart contracts and the valve opens, the amount of fluid that comes out is the stroke volume. Okay, now what happens if we increase the end diastolic volume? Will that increase the stroke volume? All right, now we have a larger end diastolic volume. What's gonna happen when I open the aortic semilunar valve? There's a much bigger stroke volume. So the fuller the ventricle is, the larger the end diastolic volume, the larger the stroke volume is going to be. And that is because as the heart muscle extends, it wants to contract more. This length tension relationship is called the Frank Starling law. So if we can increase the end diastolic volume, we will increase the stroke volume. And if we increase the stroke volume, we increase the cardiac output. So how do we increase the end diastolic volume? we have to bring more blood back to the heart. This is called preload. So the amount of blood returning to the heart, if you increase that preload, you're going to increase the end diastolic volume, then you increase the stroke volume, then you increase your cardiac output. So how do we increase the preload? So bringing more blood back. First of all, let's think about how do we bring blood back to the heart? Okay, blood is going from the heart to the arteries out to the capillaries and then coming back through the veins. So what is pushing the blood through the veins? It's called a skeletal muscle pump. So whenever we contract our muscles, we are going to push the blood back to the heart. But if you're exercising and you're contracting your muscles, you're going to push more blood back. And we need to increase our cardiac output when we're exercising. So I wanna just show you quickly how the skeletal muscle pump works, and then we also have a respiratory pump. Let's just have a look at our calf muscles, but this happens in all of our muscles. Our veins are more superficial. They're closer to the surface of our body compared to the arteries, which tend to be a little bit deeper. And every time we contract muscles, we sort of squish the veins. And when we squish the veins, it's gonna push the blood that's in the veins up and down. But we want the blood to go up. So how do we make it go up? I don't know if you can see in this diagram, but inside veins, we have valves. Valves prevent the blood from flowing in the wrong direction. So when we are pushing on these veins with our skeletal muscles, blood is gonna go through the valve in this direction and then the valve will close. When the valve closes, the blood can't go backwards. So every time we contract these muscles, we're pushing a little bit, almost like massaging the veins, and we're pushing the blood back up towards the heart. And then we also have a respiratory pump. So when we look at our thoracic cavity, and our lungs are inside. How do we get air into our lungs? Air has to go in when the pressure changes inside the thoracic cavity compared to out here in the environment. So air is gonna to move towards lower pressure. So how do we lower the pressure inside the thoracic cavity? We have to increase the volume by moving the diaphragm down. So when we breathe in, we are moving the diaphragm down because we are decreasing the pressure in the thoracic cavity. And then when we breathe out, the diaphragm simply pushes back up, it relaxes and it moves back up and it pushes the air out. So when we breathe in 
and we decrease the pressure in the thoracic cavity, it is also going to affect the blood flow. So the blood that is in the vessels, say we have our inferior vena cava here, where blood is going to be moving up towards the heart, when the thoracic cavity pressure is decreased, blood will also move towards lower pressure. So that will help to pull blood up into the thoracic cavity. So when we breathe in, we decrease the pressure and we make blood move towards the heart. When we increase the end diastolic volume, there's two main factors. So the amount of blood that's going back to the heart and how stretchy the ventricles are, how much can you fill the ventricle? And if you're younger or you exercise a lot, you're gonna have more distensibility. And then also the force of contraction. How much can the heart contract to eject the blood? Okay, and that is also dependent primarily on age and fitness level. The more exercise training that you do, the stronger your heart will become, so the more that you can increase your stroke volume. Okay, so that is preload. That is how much blood is going back. There's one other factor that affects your stroke volume. Okay, and that is afterload. Where's the blood going? Now think about when your heart is contracting, that blood has to go into the aorta and then it has to go into arteries. Okay, so the resistance in the arteries will impact how much stroke volume you can have. Okay, so if you increase the resistance in the arteries, what's gonna happen to stroke volume? It will decrease. Okay, so if you increase afterload, you will decrease stroke volume. Whereas if you increase the preload, you will increase the stroke volume. So what is going to affect the resistance of the blood vessels? How much blood can flow into those blood vessels? Two main things. So one is how distensible or how stretchy your blood vessels are. Healthier blood vessels are stretchy and can recoil. Okay, so we need to have healthy blood vessels. And we do this by exercising and eating really good diet. And so as we get older, this tends to decrease if you have heart disease or atherosclerosis where your blood vessels become rigid. If you have uncontrolled diabetes or high blood sugar, you tend to make your blood vessels a little bit more rigid and not as stretchy. Okay, the other factor is the lumen, the, the diameter of the blood vessels. So if you constrict your blood vessels, there is less room for the blood to pump into. So constriction will increase afterload, which will decrease stroke volume, which will decrease cardiac output. And then what if your blood vessels had plaque like atherosclerosis? When people have heart disease or cardiovascular disease and there's buildup of guck inside their blood vessels, that is like making the lumen smaller. That will increase the resistance, which means cardiac output cannot increase enough. The difference in cardiac output in a sedentary person versus someone that exercises on a regular basis is that trained individuals can increase their cardiac output much more, which means you can do much more work and still deliver enough nutrients and oxygen to the cells to be able to make enough energy to sustain a higher level of activity. So when you exercise, you are going to be increasing your heart rate, increasing your stroke volume. Sedentary people, if you do suddenly do some kind of exercise, then you tend to increase your cardiac output primarily by increasing heart rate. Whereas people that exercise will use heart rate and stroke volume because of the distensibility and the contractile force. So anything that increases your heart rate or increases your stroke volume is going to increase your cardiac output. The factors that affect your heart rate, body temperature, thyroid hormones, a decrease in your parasympathetic or an increase in your sympathetic autonomic nervous system response. Over here, stroke volume is impacted by preload and afterload. If we increase preload, we will increase stroke volume and increase cardiac output. How do we increase the preload? We have to bring more blood back to the heart and we do this with our muscular pump and our respiratory pump. 
And we can also do this if we increase our blood volume. So if you drank a big glass of water, you're gonna have more blood volume and you will have more venous return. How do we increase the muscular pump and the respiratory pump? We can contract our muscles. How do we increase blood volume? Drinking water. If we increase ions on our diet, if you ate salty food, it would make you hold on to a bit more water. Your kidneys would excrete less. And it would also make you thirsty, which would make you drink more water. And then if anyone had kidney problems, they would not be able to excrete enough water. So kidney function, oops, that's spelled wrong. Kidney function can affect your overall blood pressure. Now, preload that is affected by how distensible your ventricles are. If you can increase the amount they can stretch, you can increase the amount of volume, you can increase the end diastolic volume. This is primarily based on your cardiovascular fitness. And then afterload is all about where the blood is going after it's ejected from the heart, and this is all about vascular resistance. So if you decrease vascular resistance, you will decrease afterload, which will increase your stroke volume and increase your cardiac output. So we do not want vascular resistance if we want to increase our cardiac output. So how do we reduce vascular resistance? We have vasodilation, which can be controlled by the autonomic nervous system. You do not want to have cardiovascular disease or atherosclerosis. Sometimes people take vasodilator medications. It also depends on laminar flow. If your blood vessels are full of atherosclerosis, the plaque inside the vessels affects how the blood moves and it will become turbulent when you have junk in your blood vessels. So again, work out a lot and stay nice and healthy. And Blood viscosity can play a role as well. Viscosity is just the thickness of the blood, which is primarily all about your red blood cell numbers. Someone that has anemia, for example, would have low red blood cell numbers. So those are all of the factors that affect your cardiac output.